chapter 6, and we're going to be reading, um, let me see, uh, verses 30 through 44. Amen. It's the second of the messages that I'm going to be preaching on, the miracles of Jesus. And uh, for the sake of a title for this, uh, I have a title of Just One Small Lunch. Just One Small Lunch. So if you want to open your Bibles to, to again, Mark chapter 6, starting in verse 30. And the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So Jesus is off trying to uh, trying to get some time for by himself with his disciples, and uh, the people ran ahead, and and uh, the multitude was there before he arrived on the other shore. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, "This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late." Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and the villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, I like this, you give them something to eat. Like, turn to his disciples as they get, you know, he's telling them, got, they got nothing to eat, send them away, tell them to go have dinner. And uh, he turns to them and says, you feed them. So I thought, just we'll get back to that. And they said to him, "Shall we go to go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat?" Approximately in our language, it's about forty dollars worth of bread. Okay. And just so you have, uh, where was I? Uh, There we go. And he said to them, "How many loaves do you have? Go and see." And when they had found out, they said, "We have five and two fish." And then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And I like this. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and a fish. And those who ate the loaves were, get this, 5,000 men. That's not including women and children. That's just 5,000 men. That's a pretty awesome group, isn't it? Let's pray. Lord, we just love you so very much. I thank you, Lord, for your word today. God, let it speak again to our hearts today. Let it work inside of us. Not only our hearts, but our minds and our lives as well. Let Let it just bring out, Lord, the things that do not belong so that we can remove them. Let it also place within us, Jesus, portions of your character that are not yet formed in us. Lord, that we may become more like you increasingly as your word is applied in each one of our lives. God, I pray for your anointing today as I preach. I need you. Again, each and every day, more so it seems, Lord, as we see that day approaching, I need your anointing in my life. So anoint me as I preach, but Lord, don't stop there. Anoint your people as well. God, anoint them to not only receive, but also to respond to your word. God, that this may be a reciprocal uh, service today where, where I'm preaching, but they're preaching back to me, Lord. God, I pray that you will anoint them as they do so. Anoint me as, a pre- as I preach in Jesus' precious name. And everybody say, Amen. God bless you. You uh, may be seated in Jesus' name. And I always, I always got to be careful. You'll notice I always stop there. You may, because a couple of times I've said you may be dismissed, you know, and, and I know that you were all running for the door before I said, hold on a minute, that was, no. <laughs> Amen. First of all, I'm going to give you a little background uh, to, to what's happened prior to this. And uh, this is one of the miracles of Jesus that is recorded in all four Gospels. Uh, so it's not just in Mark, the one that we read, but it's also Matthew and Luke and, and John as well. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of the recollections, are, they add some things to it that may not be in the passage that I read to you today. Um, but just so we get a little background, uh, 
uh, to this. First of all, um, prior to this, at the beginning of the chapter, uh, Jesus had sent his 12 disciples out two by two. Now, he had sent them out that they would preach repentance. And we all know this, that, that repentance is preparation for the coming of Jesus into people's lives, right? That you have to have it. Without repentance, uh, you just can't get close to him. Without repentance, uh, Jesus can't come in and make the changes that he needs to. Repentance is a turning away from what you were and becoming something different. That's turning around and going in the opposite direction. So, what I was before, I've decided in repentance. I'm sorry for the way that I've been living, Jesus. I want to turn around. I want to go in the other direction. So he sent his disciples out to preach repentance. Now, at this time, it's just the 12. Later on, we find out that he sends out 50, and he sent them also out two by two as well, and uh, into the various towns and cities that he himself would eventually visit. He also gave them power. Now, understand the Holy Ghost hadn't been poured out yet. We know that that happens on the day of Pentecost, right? And, uh, and so all of them that were in the upper room, including the disciples, were initially going to get filled with the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, not prior to. And, but he gave them power to be able to have control over evil spirits. Yeah. And so here the twelve are going. And can you imagine the first time they must have done this? Yeah. Now, they'd seen Jesus do it. And they knew he could. And uh, now he sends them out two by two. And they're going to go and they're going to pre- preach repentance. You've got to repreach or you've got to repent for the kingdom is at hand and the kingdom is coming to you. And, uh, and so not only did they do this, but they made evident the anointing of their message by the miracles that they themselves did. So people would come, they'd be, uh, have evil spirits or people would be sick. And so the Bible says that, uh, that they not only cast out lots of evil spirits in their travels around Israel and, and going from town to town, but also they anointed with oil and they lay hands on the sick and the sick were healed as well. And so all of this has happened prior to the passage of Scripture that I read to you. Now the disciples are, have just arrived back from their little missionary journey and traveling around Israel. But something else has happened that's really affected Jesus as well. Because during that interim period of time, or, or just prior to the disciples arriving back, uh, Herod had arrested John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been in prison for a little while, right? And uh, now Herod did not want to kill him, didn't want to do anything to him. He actually, the, John preached to him while he was there. And the Bible says that Herod actually received John's preaching gladly and didn't want to do him any harm. Now, Unfortunately, Herod had done some bad things. For one thing, he'd taken his brother's wife and married her. Now, right off the bat, not good, right? Everybody say, not good. Anyway, so she also had a daughter. Now, for whatever reason, and the Bible doesn't really tell us what, she had something against John the Baptist. Maybe he had told her that she was in sin. I'm kind of thinking so, wouldn't you? Hey, you can't do this. You can't live like this and, and be spiritual and expect that God's going to be a part of your life. And, and so uh, I'm kind of thinking that that might have been the reason. But, but at any rate, she on Herod's birthday, had decided that she was going to send her daughter. Now, it doesn't say Herod's daughter, so I'm assuming this is the daughter of Herod's brother and the wife, right? So it's his niece. She sends, Herodias sends in her daughter, Herod's niece, in there to do a sensual dance before the king. Now, I... I'm blown away. I'm just absolutely baffled by some things that people do. It just, you know, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But Herod was so taken. There's a good word. I, I'm trying to be careful with how I say these things, right? He's so taken with, with, uh, with this dance that she does. He says, oh, this is just awesome. I will give you anything in my kingdom up to half of my kingdom for what you just did. She runs to her mom, says, what should I ask of Herod? She says, bring me the head of John the Baptist on a platter this day. 
And so she goes back into Herod and says, this is what I want. I want, I want the head of the Baptist. I want him, it brought in here. And Herod, of course, is still listening to John the Baptist, has been going down there. John has been preaching to him. And the Bible says he gladly heard him, didn't want to do this, but for the sake of all of those that were at his birthday party, and the peer pressure and what he had said that he would do, he sent the executioner down and they took John's head and brought it into the palace on a platter and presented it to the girl who took it to her mom. Now, understand something. John had a unique relationship with Jesus Christ. Because they were related, right? They were Mary and, and Elizabeth were cousins, and Elizabeth was considerably older and, and so forth, but, uh, um, but they were cousins. So, so John and Jesus were related via that relationship and together. But it was much more than just that relationship of, of, of being related by blood. Because John the Baptist had a unique ministry in the preparation for people, uh, bringing them to the place of repentance for the, in preparation or preparing the road for Jesus to be able to come in their lives. He was the one also that Jesus went to to begin his ministry. And John the Baptist was the one that baptized Jesus in the Jordan River and the dove descended and a voice from heaven and, uh, and all of that. And so this was very unique. And the one passage or the one account that is written about this, this happening, about John's head being taken, says, when the word was brought to him, when they came to him and told him, told him, that John had been executed and that his head had been given, uh, that because of this, Jesus wanted to get off by himself. So the Bible gives a couple of different reasons and a couple of different uh, versions of this account here. And, and one is, of course, they had no time for themselves. When the disciples arrived, everybody recognized them and there were people coming and going and it was just, there was so much going on that they didn't even have time to stop and have a meal by themselves. And then there was also this part of it as well, that Jesus, when he had heard that John had been executed, he wanted to get away by himself. And so they got into a boat, and they're going to go across. Now, I'm, I'm a little baffled by some of this, because they obviously didn't get very far. But I think that also, uh, maybe one of the disciples or somebody there said, hey, there's a nice desolate beach just across a little ways. If you go over there, you'll be able... And somehow the word spread of where Jesus was going to end up, where he was going to go to be by himself... Because the word just spread like wildfire and, and everybody recognized them and recognized who Jesus was and everybody wanted a piece of him and everybody wanted a little, either a healing or they wanted a word or they wanted something in their lives. And so they began to come out by the thousands out of the surrounding towns and areas around. And Jesus is going to be at this beach at this time. He's going there. He's in the boat right now and he's going to be across there before long. And the people spread the word and after a while they began to run and, and make their way towards where, where Jesus was going to arrive. All of this has happened just prior to the passage of Scripture that I read to you and, and the beginning part of this Scripture. Now, when they, uh, when they had sat there for a while and the Bible says, and, and if you read all four versions of this, you're going to find that Jesus spoke to them concerning the kingdom of God. And not only did He speak to them concerning the kingdom of God, but also He touched and healed those that were sick and that were brought to Him. And this went on all day. So I don't know when He arrived. Uh, I'm assuming because it makes it sound like it in Scripture that they'd been there for some length of time and Jesus' desire to be by himself is now, it's just gone. And the Bible says because he had compassion upon them, he stayed and he ministered to all of those that were there. So he talked to them. How many? 10, 15,000 people all told? How many women and children besides the men would have been there on that day? 
And they come to him maybe in groups or family groups and say, oh, my daughter needs a touch. Can you heal her? And Jesus would heal her. And, and he would talk to them about the kingdom and, and that the kingdom was coming and maybe talk to them like he did to Nicodemus about the fact that they needed to be born of water and of spirit to enter into the kingdom. But he spoke to them concerning the kingdom. He ministered there all that day to those thousands of people. I don't know how you minister one person to thousands of people. But he was Jesus. And somehow uh, the day passed and it's getting towards evening time. And uh, the disciples finally come to him. Said, uh, it's late. Send the people. Send them into the towns and in the countryside round about. And uh, get them to buy food and bread and, and feed them for their they're hungry. They have needs. They, uh, <laughs> I, I, I look at this passage of Scripture and I'm thinking, you know, here they are. They say there's lots of needs. How many realize there's needs in this congregation today? Yeah. Okay, can you imagine, you know, if there were thousands of us and somebody here came and says, they have needs. So here Teresa comes up and says, the congregation has needs. And, and uh, I said, well, go take care of it, you know. Just take care of the needs, you know. Uh, yeah, this is beyond me. And uh, this is beyond anything that I'd ever even thought I'd be able to do. And I think the disciples must have been a little bit astounded at his answer to them. Because uh, how are we going to feed them? Even if we had... 200 denarii worth of bread and we went out there and, and uh, bought all that bread and brought it, brought it in, it would still be nowhere near enough to be able to take care of the multitudes. And, uh, and nevertheless, that's what Jesus told him. He says, you feed them. So I think, I think there's, there's something in this miracle in the words that Jesus says that we need to take from this message today. You see, everywhere that you look around you, you're going to see people that have needs. And, and it's going to be, and I think this is probably prophetic for all of us, it's up to us to find a way to meet the needs of those that God places around us. We can't go through our lives thinking that, that our Christian lives, it's going to be good enough we just come to church. We've got, we've got to find a way to meet the needs of those that God places in our lives. However we do that, and I'm not sure how exactly that, that you can do that in your life. I don't know who God has placed in your life, but I do know that that same, that same statement can be made of every one of us. I have people in my life that have needs. Now, we can come to prayer. We bring our prayer requests before God, and I think that we need to and we should. But the end result is, when you bring your requests before God, uh, you're going to have to get up from that prayer. And if you prayed for somebody and you see a need in their life, you're going to be the hands and feet that God wants to use to meet that need in their lives. Everybody say amen. So, you feed them. You take care of them. You do whatever is necessary. Of course, they, they couldn't at that time. They still didn't feel like they had the, uh, what they needed in order to be able to do it. So Jesus asked the question again of them. He says, how many loaves do you have? Well, 12 disciples. Now, he's going to try and follow me with the camera. And uh, let me see, who can I get here? Faith, come up here for a moment. Now, I know Faith is not a boy, so you all know that. So, but she's, for now, she's good. So they're making their way through the crowd and they're asking everybody, hey, do you have any food? Do you have anything that, that we can give to minister to this crowd? Hey, you over there, do you have any food? Do you have, have you brought anything with you? And, and everybody's saying, no, no, I got, we got nothing. We just left. We didn't even grab any food. And finally they come to this beautiful young lady here. And she says, what? I have food. You have food? What do you have? How much do you have? What do you have? What did you bring with you? Five loaves, two fishes. Five loaves and two fishes. See? Pretty good, eh? Five loaves and two fishes. Okay. This is your lunch? Are you hungry? So it's for you, right? 
Now, it's not a big lunch. When it's talking about loaves, it's not talking loaves like we do. It's talking, this is a lunch for a young person. Says, so it's all for you? You weren't going to share it with anybody else? No. Uh, Can I have it? (laughs) Good girl. (laughs) Just like that. Now, thank you, Faith. Now look, I don't know about you, but I used to be a young person. I know that's hard for some of you to imagine. All the time that I was anywhere from the age of around 10 to about 30, my wife would probably uh, affirm this, I would eat anything that came close to me. I was hungry always. All the time. And here the disciples come, and this young fellow, young lady in this case, has brought a lunch. The only one that has thought ahead. The only one that it realizes, hey, this is a day trip. I better make sure that I have enough so that I have something to eat and something when I get there. And now there is Jesus' disciples saying, hey, hand it over, kid. Yeah. And, and uh, Jesus has, has need of what you have. And I, I thought to myself, you know, if it's me, I'm thinking, mm-mm, this is for me to eat in my lunch. If I give it up now, it's going to be gone and I'm going to go home hungry. But get this, the Bible does not say that he argued or fussed or said, no, you can't have it. He just gave it up. Right. One small lunch. I'm going to ask you something today. What do you have today that you can give to Jesus for Him to use? Say, well, I don't have much. Um, Maybe a testimony about a time when God's healed me. Maybe I have a certain amount of strength. Maybe I have a home that I can uh, invite somebody to or, or minister to somebody. I have some time available. Perhaps I could give my time. We always go through this calculation in our minds of what it's going to cost us. And some of us suffer with inferiority complexes where we think that what we have is not going to be good enough for the need that is presented before us. And so rather than just give what little we do have, we hold on to it thinking, well, it's not enough anyway for Jesus to be able to use. Can I tell you something today? That just a little bit in the hands of the Master can minister to a multitude if we're willing to give it up and if we're not going to hold on to it and keep it or try and keep it for ourselves. And the interesting thing is, is I don't think that the disciples forced this lad to give his lunch up. I think he was happy to do so and and just allow Jesus to be able to use it. I think if it had gone and and uh, and Jesus had just said here to his disciples and himself and they'd eaten it, it would have been okay with him because he was willing to give it up. You see, I I, I want to make a point here. God's not going to force you to give up something in your life that you don't want to give to Him. But He does ask for it. He's going to ask you to to give up a portion of your life. He may ask you to give up some time in the evening to be able to do a Bible study. He may ask you to to give up some effort and some strength to maybe go play a sport with somebody. That's and I have to tell you that that when when I first came to God, the pastor that was in Nanaimo at the time, he did everything with me just to try and spend time with me. He went and played tennis with me. I beat him unmercifully. I played until his feet bled. And, and he just kept on, kept on trying. And then we'd go out and play golf. And, and uh, he was a little better at that than, than tennis. But, but he, yeah. So we went back to tennis again because Nichols just loved to win. I mean, that's just... The point is, is that, that somewhere along the line, we may not think that it's enough. We may not think that it's something that God can use. We may think that, that there's no way that it will meet the needs of those that are around us. But God doesn't need a whole lot from us. He just needs us to be willing 
to give what we do have so that He can use it. So they bring the lunch. They bring the two fishes and the five loaves to Jesus. Um, now they, they must have had some baskets and, and so Jesus blesses it. He raises His head towards heaven and, and He blesses it, prays over His food. We pray over our food too, right? Amen. You better because you don't know what's in that stuff nowadays. And, uh, and so he blesses it and puts it in the baskets, the 12 baskets, and away go his disciples. Now, at the time the disciples took it, I'm thinking there's a few crumbs of bread and, and maybe a small piece of fish in each basket. But as, he's, as they're making their way, now he's got everybody, 5,000 men, he's got them divided up into groups of 50 and groups of 100 over here and 50 over here and, and uh, the disciples, you know, dividing the crowd up and, and huge, huge yeah. crowd on this hillside. Yeah. And, uh, and then they bring the basket. I don't have a basket here, do I? Nope, used to be one there. Um, and they bring the basket around. And they're holding the basket. And probably, you know, if it's me, I'm not looking. You know? Because I know as soon as Josephine takes some, there's not going to be any left. Because there's just a little bit in there. It's not a lot. It's not because Josephine's going to eat a lot. It's just because there's not a lot in there. It's a few crumbs. You know, it's a little few pieces of bread and a little few pieces of fish. And so Josephine takes some out of there and... And I'm Peter over here, and I'm, okay, Ed, your turn. And Ed takes them out of there, and I make my way back over to Teresa, and, and, and Teresa takes them out of there, and I'm thinking, oh, man, these guys are going to have one mouthful, and they're done. And, and I just keep going from person to person, and each person takes more out. Whew. And the basket never runs out. There's always some in there for the next person. You know when I think the miracle ended? When everyone was full. When everyone was satisfied. That that's when the bread stopped and the fish stopped. And then they went over and everybody's grabbing out of the basket and and it must have taken a long time to feed 5,000 men plus women and children, right? I mean, that, I mean, you go into a restaurant nowadays, you can wait sometimes on, you know, three quarters of an hour, an hour, you know, if it's a bad restaurant, maybe, you know, less if, uh, you know, preparing food, you know, and, and then they got to serve it and all the rest. 5,000 men plus women and children. And the disciples are just making their way from one group to another. And then the basket is, is inside the basket. It just keeps being more bread and more fish. And at the end of it all, they gathered up uh, 12 baskets full of remains. Remaining bread and remaining fish. You see, when God does something, He does it well. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together as the musicians come, shall we? 12 baskets. Everyone was satisfied of the 5,000. And you'll notice in, in two passages or two chapters later in this book, in the book of Mark here, that Jesus does it again but feeds 4,000 uh, men, not including women and children. The disciples must have been amazed at the, at, at the amount that they were able to feed from five loaves and two small fishes. Today, as we're in this sanctuary together, I want to impress upon you that each one of you has something to give. It's not like Jesus' disciples going from person to person and says, I got nothing. I got nothing. But in this service today, each one of you have something that you can give that Jesus can multiply and use it to minister to those that are around you and those that He puts within the sphere of your influence that, uh, that He can use. And I want you to know that even if you think it's just a little bit, all it takes is one small lunch to feed a multitude in Jesus' hands. All it takes is one child of God willing to say, here, take what I have. Use it and use me for God to bring revival to a congregation, to a city, and to a country. All it took was one Paul to change Europe and Asia Minor. All it can take is just one person that's willing to say, Here, God, use me. 
It may not seem like much to us what you have or what I have to give. In Jesus' hands, what little we have can be used mightily. The little we have can minister to so many. I want to open up this altar for a little bit. I want you to think about what you have that you can give. Now I know that sometimes we have an altar call and it's for salvation. It's for repentance. It's for renewal. This is a little different today. Because I want to open up this altar and and I'd like for everybody to take a look right now. What do you have in you that you can offer the Lord to use? We can, we can apply a certain amount of selfish spirit, if you would, to what we have, thinking it's my time. Jesus could have done that initially when He went there. He went there to be alone with His disciples. And yet he had compassion on all the multitude that was there. We could think, this is going to satisfy me. And it's just enough for me. And it's... I have to wonder about this because the Bible doesn't say this. But I kind of think that it probably there's an application here. That some of those baskets that were gathered up went back to that little boy. You see, the Bible says, Give and it shall be given unto you. How? Poured into, pressed down, shaken to fill all, it all up, and then again poured into overflowing. So I kind of think maybe that little boy gave five loaves and two fishes and got back a basket full of fish and loaves. Because I think that that's just the way that Jesus works in our lives. You'll never outgive God. You will never outgive God. He's always going to pour back into your life whatever you should give to Him. So this altar is open. Let's come and offer something of our lives. Maybe it's an evening that you can do where you're going to minister to others. Maybe it's uh, maybe you've got extra money laying around you can help somebody with. Maybe you just need to give somebody a Bible study. You need to go take somebody for coffee or you need to do something that's going to minister. Maybe it's not very much, but in Jesus' hands it's going to be enough. This altar is open. Let's come and offer something to the Lord, shall we? Hallelujah.